This video is brought to you by the Sweat Elite Coaching Academy, Sweat Elite's coaching arm that has been operating since February 2023 with almost 100 members now spread out all over the world. A common question we're asked is, is there a standard to join the Sweat Elite Coaching Academy? All you need is a willingness to learn and a desire to improve. Sweat Elite Coaching Academy membership includes a hyper-personalized training plan, access to the community via Discord where there's conversations going on every day about racing and training, and you also get access to a high level physiotherapist in case you need any help with physical performance. Join the Sweat Elite Coaching Academy today by checking out sweatelitecoaching.com. You can find the link in the description of this video. This video is also brought to you by Pillar Performance, and there's a reason why so many of the world's best triathletes and runners and cyclists are taking triple magnesium by Pillar Performance before bed to improve their sleep quality and ultimately their recovery. I'm not a huge supplement person. I'm open to trying more or less anything, but most things just don't stick. I don't find a lot of benefit in most supplements, but triple magnesium by Pillar Performance has been a game changer for my sleep, and I know that so many others have found the same benefit with triple magnesium by Pillar Performance. I travel around the world, change beds, change time zones all the time, and I'm noticing that I'm falling asleep faster and staying asleep longer by using triple magnesium by Pillar Performance before bed. You can give it a try by using the code SWEAT15, and you can score 15% off your first order and score a free micro shaker as well. So I've been working with pro runners probably since 2010 uh, with Nike. Yeah. So, I mean, I've worked quite a bit with Mo Farah, Galen Rupp, Matt Centrowitz, Safan Hassan, uh, Shannon Roberry. Um, I'm going to miss a lot of people, you know, currently Raven Rogers, Donovan Brazier, uh, Sinclair, Johnson, uh, Charlie Hunter, Jess Hall, um, Coco, Constanza Plasterhoff, and obviously Cam for years now. Um, and I mean, there's a lot more that I didn't name. Um, but my role is primarily as a physical therapist, as a strength coach, uh, kind of a biomechanist, just to make sure that they maintain good form and mechanics and efficiency. Uh, today, Cam is going to do a relatively easy lift. He's got a 10K coming up, so we're really tapering him off of the volume and the load and the intensity in the weight room. Normally, Cam lifts three days a week, uh, two probably lifts that take about 75 minutes. Uh, and then he always does a kind of an isolated, or not necessarily isolated, but a short lift after his long runs of about 20 minutes. Okay. And he'll go straight from his, roll, his long run right into a kind of a moderate load leg circuit for another 20 minutes just to kind of train capacity when he's fatigued. Today we'll probably work for about 45 minutes. Right now he's working through some dynamic mobility, which is where we always start. Uh, we'll do some ground-based mobility that is a little bit specific for him. We know that he has a couple things in his spine that we need to loosen up in certain directions. So we'll do some very specific mobility work for Cam on the ground, and then we'll go into some foot and ankle uh, cap strength. We'll go into some stability work, some isolation hip and core work, um, and then just a little bit of heavy load today, but not much. Awesome. Very interesting. Thank you, Sherry. We were saying off air before that, uh, you know, we see on social media these heavy lifts and these mm -hmm. squats and these big... You were saying that's probably roughly about 20% more or less of the overall plan but you also mentioned that durability is a big thing that you that you work on. Is that what accurate to say? Durability yeah. is huge. I mean, anytime that we get a new athlete, we start the entire process with a comprehensive clinical evaluation that takes about an hour, hour and a half. Yep. A very comprehensive biomechanical assessment in our biomechanics lab. And that the testing takes about an hour and a half to two hours. And then the interpretation process and the data aggregation takes another hour. But all of that information lets us know where the potential weaknesses and the inefficiencies are in a runner. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that we need to do is really optimize durability because they have to tolerate training volume and training intensity consistently week over week. So we really focus on durability. Um, but then, you know, we also focus on a lot of mobility and it's really independent to the athlete. You know, it's very specific to the athlete. Some athletes need a lot more mobility than strength and power. Other athletes need more strength and power and they have a lot of mobility. Um, so the, the general recipe is similar, but the ingredients become different for each one of the athletes. Sure. Um, but yeah, the, the heavy stuff in any athlete's program is normally only about 20%. Yeah. And I think that that's, there's a misconception that it's more, because I think that, well, I know that a lot of times my athletes give me the camera when they're doing a heavy exercise or a plyometric exercise, and that's what shows up on their social media. So, you know, people are looking through their social media and all of their lifting, all of their gym work has heavy elements to it. Yeah. But that's really only about 20% of what we do. Okay. How are you doing today, Cam? Good, yeah. yeah.
lifts. Let's do one set with the weight. We'll do seated. We'll do inversions, eversions. And then we'll do another set without the weight. And another sit of seated. Okay. Uh, Every athlete that I work with, we always do some very specific soleus strength work. Um, we know from a lot of research, actually the researcher was this guy named Dorn back in 2012, looked at muscle strength as a multiple of body weight to mm -hmm. see like how strong do different muscles have to be in a runner to be durable and effective. Mm -hmm. um, and his findings show that the soleus has to be the strongest muscle in your body as a multiple of your body weight. It has to generate up to eight times your body weight and strength every time your foot hits the ground, yeah. which is remarkable. So we do a lot of soleus strength with our athletes. Only mechanical machine that I have in my gym, just because it does a great job of isolating the soleus. Yeah, I mean, sure. everything else that we do, we use you know kettlebells and medicine balls and dumbbells and Olympic bars and plyometric boxes and stability services. But as far as machines go, this is the only machine that we really need it's because right. it does such a good job of keeping the wheels healthy. Mm -hmm. All the calf stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you always recommend that uh, athletes do these um, specific strength workouts post a run session, or does it not really matter too much when you put it into the week? Normally, we like to keep our hard days hard, and yep. easy days easy. Yep. So if the athlete can tolerate it, and they respond well to it, and they adapt well to it, then we prefer to do lifting after workouts. So then the next two days, if they're on a seven-day cycle, can really just be kind of recovery yep. and just base miles. Every once in a while, I have an athlete that prefers to do their hard lift the day after a workout just because they feel a little bit fresher they can get a little bit more out of it um but that's pros and cons to both right? there's pros and cons to both yeah. yeah you know another good thing about doing a lot of the strength work after a workout is we're challenging fatigued muscles yeah. so we actually get a little bit of a more exaggerated adaptation mm -hmm. just because the muscle is already fatigued and then we're trying to strengthen it Losing my balance, putting on the band, always a good sign. Yep. <laughs> cool. One more set here um, with no weight, and we'll do one more set of just eight with the same weight over here. Set. We're going to do two rounds, but we're going to have a little bit less volume. So let's do six um, lunge to toe touch. Let's do five heel tap toe touch. And let's do six runner pulls. Yeah. Just three times through. Let's actually also do lunging rotations to work on spinal mobility as well. So we'll do bang, bang, six, five, six, six, two times through. Okay. And sorry, this is lunge and toe touch Just back lunge then? up, toe touch up. Yeah, six of those. Yep. So shoulders back, chest up. There you go. Nice. Like simple cues like that can like increase. I mean, he just increased his his balance and his proprioception a little bit just by kind of stacking everything up a little bit better. And Kim's been getting into this habit where he's kind of like starting to fold forward through his chest. So I'm always reminding him to keep the shoulders back, chest up. Yeah. And when we do some of the kind of more explosive power based work, if he just pulls his shoulder back, his shoulders back, you can actually see that he has an increased amount of force production into the ground. It's pretty wild. Like small cues can make big differences.
It's your favorite one, Cam? <laughs> it looks like the easiest thing in the world, but yeah, it's like the most difficult. pulls rotations then switch pulls rotations. Vertebrae is like three or four vertebrae at the base of his thoracic oh. spine, where his thoracic spine interfaces with his lumbar spine, that are kind of anchored into a little bit of a right rotation, and they don't rotate to the left very well. Um, so a lot of the kind of specific exercises for Cam, some of the ground mobility that he does every day, uh, involves trying to improve that left rotation in that segment, uh, section of segments, and then we really try to reinforce it with just keeping an eye on his rotation when he's doing a lot of these exercises. And he does it really well, so I don't have to cue him yeah. that much. Yeah. He just knows we really need to continue to kind of work through greater ranges of left rotation, and he knows where he's trying to isolate it. suffer more in front of the audience. Uh, anytime that we're working with a runner, um, we always do a cluster of single leg balance exercises, kind of like what you see Cam doing right now. Yep. And we'll sequence three or four or five different exercises together that all require like single leg balance, good posture, stacking everything up. Um, ultimately because as runners, you never have both feet on the ground. No. So if you don't train having strength, stability, and postural awareness on one foot in a running specific pose, in the gym, then it's gonna be hard to really find that effectively and efficiently when we're running. So, you know, I always tell the runners that if you ever find yourself with both feet on the ground in a race, you're probably not gonna win. So, we need <laughs> to train a small chance, being yeah. competent on one <laughs> Especially foot. Especially at Cam's level. two touches and switch three slides two touches and then bend the box to wall drive bend the box drives we'll do three rounds of that okay okay sounds good do you want inside grip please yeah so do you say threes and twos or fours and twos three slides two yes. touches and then Done this nonsense. 
hoodie on one of you in these too, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that much worse, that much harder than it used to be at least. weight just in one hand really makes the, the balance a lot more challenging. Oh, yeah. And if you had 30 pounds in each hand, then you're counterbalanced. So it doesn't really affect your balance that much. But when you have 53 pounds in one hand on one side of your body, it takes a lot more strength and kind of core stability and hip stability to like maintain that balance and alignment. You can so let's let's tell two, two, two drives and then two box runs. Keeping that foot down better on the left side. Looks like it's just becoming more natural. It doesn't feel like it's taking every ounce of effort to do it anymore, at least. Mentally and physical? Ground base mobility stuff, like the new series. And then we're going to do one round of hips and core. Yeah. And good. that'll be it. Um, do you want me to start evening this out yet? Is it still what off? Let's not. Yeah. Let's not. It, it doesn't look that off to me, but let's wait until after the, probably after the half marathon. Just keep things as are. Yeah. Then after the half marathon. Rotational back stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and these are things that I just do every day. He just has some sort of exercises. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, reverse clamshells, butterfly clamshells. Uh, let's just do 15s of those. And then one booty blast, um, side planks, just a set of eight, rows and rotations. Just side plank, James dips, knee drives, eight, and then rows and rotations, that's it. So 15 reverse, 15 butterfly clams, booty blast, eights for the side plank series. 15, eights, eights? Yeah. I'll stay here. I'll keep feeling that. 
Thanks. I think I'm getting better remembering, but it's a crapshoot still. Is there a way you test for weakness of the core, or is it something that you think everyone should be doing regardless of the, um, the strength? I have everybody should be doing it. All my runners do it, no yeah. matter how strong the core is. Um, I have better better luck looking at core strength and stability biomechanically yeah. than I do with any clinical testing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I really rely on the data that I get from the biomechanics lab to really help me figure out what we need to do from a core strength and stability standpoint with runners. Yeah. And with Cam, like we've seen biomechanically that when he loads, so when you load, you're gonna get a little bit of a lateral transfer of your torso, kind of over your pelvis, just a little bit. But for Cam, it would be excessive. Yeah. Like with our system, we can look at it as a uh, measurement of degrees. We don't wanna have more than four degrees of kind of a lateral torso shift. And Cam gets up to about six degrees. So we know that he needs a lot of kind of strength and stability in that coronal plane. Sure. to prevent excessive lateral shifting of his torso. Yeah. So he ends up doing a lot of like lateral based plank work as a part of his program. Let's do a million dollar stretch, a little bit of dynamics, and you're done. Easy. Thankfully. So the last time he was in was probably four or five weeks ago, six weeks ago, and we did a series of probably five or six different running tests yeah. um, at different speeds and different footwear. So this is our landing page. So this lets us know everything that we're looking at. So we have on the 3D spinal modeling, and we're going to look at this with a lot more specificity. So this is the 3D spinal modeling that's uh, driven by a technology called raster stereography. We have a pressure plate treadmill. This is a high-speed treadmill with a pressure plate embedded. Then we have slow motion video analysis from the front, the sides, and the back. The really cool thing about the system is the entire thing is integrated. So at any one moment, so I can go to, we'll say toe off. So we're gonna look at the left side here. So we'll progress forward to toe off. And we know that this is toe off because it's the last presence of pressure over here in the pressure plate. Yep. So I can go one slide forward and his toes off the ground because we have no more pressure. So we know that's toe off. So we can say, you know, at toe off, if we want to go into the spine, we can look at the exact position of the spine in the transverse plane and in the frontal plane at that exact moment. So it's all like sequenced. Um, so for Cam, back this up. So here we're looking at the 3D spinal mechanics uh, as he's running at 12.8 miles an hour in the Metaspeed Edge, which is a shoe that really works well for his foot. 
he hasn't raced in those yet. So this is the 3D spinal representation. And as I told you in the gym, this has accuracy up to two degrees of motion in all three planes for each vertebral segment. So a lot of accuracy. Um, this is used pretty heavily in research and in uh, medicine, especially over in Europe. It's a German company that's developed this technology. Um, so what we're looking at here is we're, we're looking at rotation of each one of the segments. So you can see that we have T8 right here, which is the eighth thoracic vertebrae. So it's the eighth vertebrae here in the thoracic spine. Yeah. So we can go you know, T9, T10, T11, all the way down to T12. And with CAM, what we see here is we see a very different shape down here in this section of vertebrae. So between about T11 all the way down to about L4, we can see that we have kind of this hourglass where he's getting a lot less gray shadow over here on the right side than the left side. Yeah. So what the system is looking at here, it's looking at the orientation of each one of these spinous processes, which is a bony landmark on the back of each vertebral body. So it's looking at the orientation of those spinous processes in relationship to vertical as we're looking from the back. So if we have a lack of right deflection of this red line, that right deflection represents a left rotation. Sure. So we can see here with Cam that he has a lack of left rotation from about T11 all the way down to about L3, L4. So a lot of the stuff that we're doing with him, specifically in the gym for mobility, is to improve left rotation of that segment of his spine and then reinforce it with some strength work, mm -hmm. uh, which is what you just kind of saw. So, and the interesting thing is that when we have an athlete that has a lack of kind of left rotation in this area called the thoracolumbar junction of the spine, it then manifests as excessive rotation in the pelvis. So we can see here that the pelvis goes up to about 15 degrees of left rotation and 9 degrees of right rotation. 9 degrees of right rotation at 12.8 miles an hour is really good. 15 degrees is excessive. But the reason that he's getting excessive left pelvic rotation is because he's not getting the left rotation through his spine. And the pelvis is the platform. That's the foundation of everything that we're doing as runners, or is it these guys are doing as runners. My scan looks very different than this. <laughs> it looks like a train wreck. So if the pelvis is a little bit off, then that's going to come at a cost of biomechanical efficiency and, and running economy. So improving the left rotation through here is going to help minimize the left rotation in his pelvis out of that excessive zone to make him even more efficient than he already is. So, um, so that's one thing that we found in his last test that we really wanted to correct. Another thing that we found that we didn't necessarily love, and this is kind of a new manifestation, but this is what we test like every three months or every four or five months, is because new things show up. So for Cam, historically he had had an issue with his right leg, where when he loaded, let me go through this one more time. So historically, when Cam would load his right leg, he would get an excessive inward collapse of the knee, the knee would kind of dive in towards midline. And we're actually looking at that angle right here. So right now it's 179 degrees. 180 degrees would be perfectly straight. The femoral bisection here would be in line with the tibial bisection. 179 means he's in one degree of an inward collapse, which is totally fine. As we go into mid stance, that'll increase up to about 175. That's the high end of what I think is okay for a runner. So we're still working to get this right knee out a little bit, but it had been a lot worse than this. So this is within the range that I think is fine, but we still need some improvement. Uh, and we've known about this for a while, but on the left side, what happens when he loads the leg, and this is a very new manifestation, is he goes into 190 degrees, so he's in 10 degrees of a varus or an outward collapse. And this outward collapse is happening because of an external rotation impulse of his leg. As he loads this leg, the femur is kind of spinning into external rotation, and it's carrying the knee with it. So this excessive external rotation impulse is normally a manifestation of weakness in the internal rotators in the left hip complex. So we started to add a lot more isolation internal rotation strength into Camp's program to help bring this knee back around a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that we found that we didn't necessarily love. Um, do you remember anything else we found? Those are the two main things I believe. Yeah, I mean we found some difference with the shoes like my, I think right. I was, yeah, doing a bit better with this edge versus the sky. The, mm -hmm. um, now it's just with the way the foot was landing, I think, and the sky was like I was landing a bit more outside, I think. And yeah, you, you stayed on the outside edge a little bit more. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so when we're looking at his shoe comparison, so here we're looking at the uh, pressure plate data. Um, and there's a lot of different things that we can look at in here. So, this is looking at kind of center of pressure over the course of his contact time from initial contact here 
through mid stance here and then all the way through kind of toe off through here. And this all looks really pretty good. He's landing on the lateral side of his forefoot, which is where a lot of our pro runners land. Um, he gets a little bit of a posterior deflection here during mid stance, which just corresponds with kind of that dorsal flexion moment when he's loading. But then everything kind of just rolls forward. You can see on the left side, he rolls out a little bit more on the left side than he does on the right side. And that's just that stiffness in the ankle. That's not a shoe problem. That's a Cam's foot is still stiff problem. Mm -hmm. But this is a lot better than the other shoe that he had tried. Uh, the Metas, what was the other one? The Meta Sky. Speed Sky. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we can also like get really granular and go in and look at stride length on the left compared to the right, uh, step time left compared to right. You look at how much uh, the feet turn out. I mean, there's just a lot of parameters. This is something that I end up looking at quite a bit in our runners, is so the system has taken Cam's foot and compartmentalized it into the big toe here, blue, lateral toes in purple, first, second, third, fourth, fifth metatarsal uh, in these colors. Midfoot is represented as green, and then the rear foot is this purple in this kind of lime green. We don't have a lot of rear foot representation in Cam because he's a four foot runner and he has really strong calves. So all of these zones come across and populate these graphs from initial contact to zero to toe off 100% of stance phase. So we can look at toe pressure distribution on the right side compared to the left side. We can look at metatarsal stress distribution. Uh, and the right side looks pretty good. We want the first metatarsal, the yellow guy, to absorb most of the force. That's a big durable bone that is designed to be loaded. Then we have second, third, and fourth down here. And then we have the fifth metatarsal down here. Um, we don't want to see much more than about 50 newtons of force in the fifth metatarsal. Cam's up to about 100 on the right side, but he's never had any issues in the right foot, so I'm not that concerned about it. But we can see here on the left side that he gets up to about 200 newtons of force in that fifth metatarsal, and that's because he's still a little bit stiff in that left ankle, and he's still on the outside of that foot a little bit more. So since we found this during the testing back on 328, 2023, We've been doing a lot more of those slam for drop-ins. We've been doing a lot more of cueing, making sure that he keeps his big toe into the ground. Um, after the half marathon in a couple of weeks, we'll probably retest him again, and we'll just see if we're making progress in a lot of these variables, both in kind of this pressure variable, um, in that uh, the spine rotation to the yeah. left, and then also in the that external rotation impulse on that left side. So those would be the three things that we're kind of tracking and trying to attack specifically for CAM to improve durability, improve efficiency. Super interesting. Really appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah.